Eleanor Roosevelt, Her Path to Kindness by Helene Becker, illustrated by Aura Lewis. The future is literally in our hands to mold as we like, but we cannot wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow is now. Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor had always felt at home in her father's arms, safe. But now the fog clotted around them. Where had the waves gone? The sky? Thump. The SS Britannic was taking Eleanor and her family from New York to England when it was rammed by another ocean liner. The captain feared it might sink. They had to abandon ship. The lifeboat far below pitched and yawed. Father raised his arms. Jump, he yelled. But he looked so small. Eleanor just couldn't. In an effort to save her, a crewman threw Eleanor overboard into the lifeboat. She plunged, screaming, down to the sea. Eleanor survived the ordeal, but the experience was never forgotten. As time passed, Eleanor's fears swelled and multiplied. She was afraid of mice, snakes, and horses. She was afraid of the dark. She was even afraid of other children. Then tragedy struck. Eleanor's mother, brother, and father died all within two years. Eleanor was sent to live with Grandmother Hall. There was not much kindness in Grandmother Hall's house. Eleanor felt more frightened and lonely than ever. When Eleanor was 15, Grandmother Hall wrote a letter to Allenswood, a girls' boarding school in England. Without consulting Eleanor, she asked if they would take her granddaughter in. The school said yes. The headmistress of Allenswood had a penetrating gaze. As she considered young Eleanor, Mademoiselle Souvestre's eyes softened. She thought that this sad, shy girl had something special to offer. Mademoiselle Souvestre took Eleanor under her wing. She called Eleanor Toddy, and Eleanor was allowed to call Mademoiselle Souvestre Sue. Under Sue's guidance, Eleanor began to come out of her shell. Eleanor was able to help girls who struggled with their lessons. She rushed to comfort those who seemed lonely or sad. She participated in sports even when she didn't want to. She worked hard and improved so much that she eventually made the varsity field hockey team. The other girls grew to admire Eleanor. Every Saturday, they'd leave violets in her room as their way of saying thank you and we love you. At Allenswood, Eleanor found her first true home. She was no longer lonely, and for the first time in her life, she was not afraid. Meanwhile, Sue had plans for Eleanor. She invited her on a trip to the continent. You'll organize everything, Sue said. You'll do the packing and unpacking, arrange the schedules, buy the tickets, and read all the maps. Eleanor jumped at the chance. She loved the responsibility and the freedom of doing things for herself. On the train to Pisa, the conductor called out the name of a town by the sea. Sue's eyes sparkled. I've always enjoyed seeing the stars shine over the Mediterranean. I'm sure you will too. She tossed her suitcase off the train and jumped out. So did Eleanor. It was the greatest thrill of Eleanor's young life. Eleanor spent three glorious years at Allenswood, but she knew she would have to return to New York before her final year. Grandmother Hall expected Eleanor to debut in high society and find a suitable husband. Eleanor would never forget Mademoiselle Silvestre. Sue had given her a home, but more importantly, she'd taught Eleanor how to make a home for herself inside her own heart wasn't the least bit interested in becoming a debutante. So while she went along with her grandmother's wishes, she also joined a new charitable organization called the Junior League. With another league volunteer, she'd teach at the college settlement on Rivington Street, a community center that catered to recent immigrants. As she approached the settlement house for the first time, a wave of terror threatened to engulf her. What poverty! but Eleanor resolved not to let her old enemy, fear, get the better of her. Instead, she jumped in with both feet. Literally, her job was teaching children exercises and dance. Eleanor also became an investigator for the Consumers League of New York City. In that role, she visited sweatshops where children as young as four made artificial flowers in overcrowded garrets. 
Appalled by what she saw, Eleanor wrote open letters to newspapers advocating for better working conditions. In the tenements of New York, surrounded by friends and doing work she loved, Eleanor was finally in her element. She had no time for fear. Her work was too important. Eleanor's mind and heart were full as the train pulled into the station. She had so much to tell Grandmother Hall when she arrived at their country house on the Hudson. To her surprise, she bumped into her cousin Franklin on his way to his own country home. Throwing caution to the wind, Eleanor told Franklin about her grand plans to make the world a better place, one without poverty, where people could improve their lives through better health care, education, and regulated working conditions. Franklin got a twinkle in his eye. That is a wonderful idea, he agreed. With Franklin's backing, Eleanor embarked on a thrilling new adventure to make her sweeping vision a reality. Now that she'd managed to overcome her fears, she'd let nothing stand in her way. Eleanor's warm heart, devotion to hard work, and belief in public service inspired many others to join her. Together, they would take action. Together, they would change the world. Courage is more exhilarating than fear, and in the long run, it is easier. Eleanor Roosevelt